All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to ITIF's webinar, Insights from Social Media for Safety in the Metaverse. My name is Juan Londoño, and I am ITIF's Augmented and Virtual Reality Policy Analyst. And today, I have the privilege to be alongside a stellar group of panelists, which I would like to introduce. First, we have Anne Hobson. Anne is a policy manager at Meta's Reality Labs. Prior to that, she was a program manager at the Mercatus Center, a technology policy fellow at the Arts Institute, and a public policy associate at Facebook. Anne has a PhD in economics from George Mason University. Next, we have Charlotte Wilner. Charlotte is the executive director of the Trust and Safety Professional Association. Charlotte joined TSPA and the Trust and Safety Foundation after 15 years of working in online trust and safety in companies like Facebook and Pinterest. Last, but definitely not least, we have Jessica Otlaw. Jessica is a behavioral scientist and the founder of The Extended Mind. She creates decision tools to advance social and behavioral science into emerging technologies. She focuses on virtual and augmented reality because of their potential to, to give people new experiences of understanding data, co-locating across distance, and how embodiment can influence the decision maker. She is the author of a book on cognitive biases in product development and another one on decision making. Now that we introduce this amazing cast of speakers, let's start our discussion. For better or worse, the metaverse, that term used to describe the 3D virtual environments that are the future of cyberspace, is being built upon the foundations of what we call the current 2D internet. This makes it very likely that the metaverse will inherit many of the challenges present on today's internet, particularly with issues like privacy, content moderation, and teen and children's safety. Addressing these issues will not be an easy task as developers and trust and safety teams will save numerous technical, practical, and even ethical hurdles, which can limit the ability to act. For example, is screening the interaction between users in a platform where interactions happen in real time, and they can make use of both verbal and nonverbal communication introduces both technical and privacy concerns. This is why this panel brings together this stellar cast of activists, product managers, and trust and safety professionals, which can paint a complete, complete picture over what are the main priorities that we ought to look ahead as we look into creating a safe, inclusive and equitable metaverse, alongside with the technical challenges that may arise on the way. Let's start with some individual questions. First, I have a question for Anne Hobson. Hi, Anne. Hello. So Anne, Meta is at the forefront of the transition from that 2D social into that so the social XR, or what some people call the metaverse. What are like the biggest lessons that the company has learned with its prior experiences with Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, and wh how is that gonna carry over to the Horizon platform and beyond? Thanks, Juan. And first, thank you for putting this together and, and to Lauren, who is working magic behind the scenes. So uh, I also, I wanna start by clarifying um, that there are unique differences between social media experiences and, and what we are building towards this, this metaverse. Um, XR technologies are different form factors and they're centered on, as you mentioned, sort of real time and embodied interaction. So when I participate in meetings and workrooms in VR, for example, I can tell that I feel that I'm really there because I have the same emotional re reaction as I would if I was in a conference room. For me, that is a degree of nerves, for example. Um, I think it's important to know that because there are differences, our approaches to our key areas of focus from a policy perspective will have to evolve. Um, and we're also going to have to work with a wide range of stakeholders to inform that evolution. So our key areas of focus as we build towards the metaverse are privacy, safety and integrity, economic opportunity and equity and inclusion. And as part of this ongoing effort, we're facilitating independent external research with institutions across the globe, because we don't only want to rely on lessons learned from our own experiences on existing apps. One example is we're working with Seoul National University and the University of Hong Kong to focus on research uh, into safety ethics and responsible design in the metaverse. Uh, we're also working with UN Women uh, on what equitable and safe spaces in the metaverse should look like. Uh, 
some examples are papers on, on safety and inclusion on uh, non-discriminatory avatars to empower gender inclusion in different cultural contexts. One thing that is not always immediately obvious is that the metaverse is going to include both two-dimensional and three-dimensional experiences. And we're already experiencing that today. In fact, we're experiencing right now. This is a, a 2D entry point, so I'm talking to you on my screen. Um, but I can go behind me and pick up books um, off my shelf. And, and that is a, a 3D experience um, in real time. And so you can imagine entering uh, uh, digital spaces where there are 3D avatars that are embodied, but also you can interact with them in, in this format. Um, as Juan mentioned, when we're talking about the metaverse, we're talking about a set of virtual spaces where you can share immersive experiences with other people even when you can't be together. So in the future, you may be able to be able to take your avatar from say Minecraft on a PC to Animal Crossing on Nintendo Switch to a Facebook group to a VR experience like Workrooms that I mentioned. And this degree of interoperability and seamless travel is still very much a work in progress that will take that multi-industry cooperation I talked about and even beyond industry because uh, companies or excuse me, governments like Seoul is building a municipal metaverse that will have to be interconnected with our future metaverses. So to, to conclude, like I think the, the through line here is social itself between social media and, and metaverse experiences. And Horizon Worlds gives us a glimpse into what social experiences in the metaverse could look like. So in Horizon Worlds, for example, we're leveraging learnings from proactive integrity measures across um, our other experiences to enqueue potentially problematic worlds for review. Um, by, for example, using text-based classifiers on world titles and descriptions. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that VR is, is this new, new form factor. Uh, so our tooling in VR will not, some of it will not have a 2D equivalent. And we can talk about that uh, more later. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. Our next question is for Charlotte Wilner. Hi, Charlotte. Hello. So Charlotte, my, my big question for you is, when you compare the current offerings of social XR platforms with what would be like those hum, uh, Amlog 2D uh, landscape, they tend to look more like platforms like Discord or Reddit, where content moderation tends to be more decentralized. And it's usually users opting in into content in the same way I could join a Discord server or a subreddit. So what do you think is, is the biggest advantage and the biggest challenge that this model has, particularly from a trust and safety perspective. Yeah, um, thank you so much for inviting us to be here today because this is the stuff we love to talk about. Um, I'm at TSPA, which is a, a nonprofit supporting people who work in moderation jobs, among other things, in trust and safety. And uh, we get to think a lot about questions like this, like, well, what, you know, what is the future going to look like for this? And I think you're exactly right in asking this question um, because the the advantages and the disadvantages or the challenges as you said are probably going to be the same thing actually it's going to be two sides of the same coin so community-based moderation like this um tends to be really nimble and responsive in a way that especially sort of the larger scaled platforms have trouble really mimicking um that means it can flex to new situations as they arise on the ground in real time and that is really good in some circumstances but there's also a flip side of that. You know, if there aren't really strong anchoring principles in the community in question, moderation can be overreactive, right? Or it can go too far. It can be under responsive where people say, yeah, yeah, actually that's fine. And sort of ignore that. In fact, there's a threat sort of building in the community. So, um, you know, I think that nimbleness can go two ways. Uh, similarly, I think one of the strengths that that moderation um, sort of ecosystem presents or one of the opportunities it presents is that it tends to be really bound by community values. So this is authority drawn from a community, often you know quite small or sort of long-standing, something you know community that's really tight knit, and that is great if those community values are great. Um, but they're only as good as they are. And so um, I think there's sometimes this perception that in the more centralized platforms, there's like these tyrannical moderation rulings from the small team of elites who are out of touch and like. Maybe, but that is the same problem we definitely see in, in certain communities in the ways that they do moderation. Um, the, the authority um, you know, can, can go both of those ways. And so um, we actually uh, at TSPA have a, a curriculum we call the Trust and Safety Curriculum 
It's a free accessible resource written by our member volunteers that addresses a lot of these different styles and trade-offs uh, of moderation. Um, it's based on work by Robin Kaplan. Uh, we talk a lot about community moderation, artisanal moderation, and I'd encourage folks to, to read about it because um, the volunteers talk at length about um, you know, there are, there are good parts to this, and there are also some challenges that are unique to each one of those types of moderation. And there's no one good answer. That's why all of it is trade-offs. Okay. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And now, next, we have Jessica Alba. Hi, Jessica. Hey. So, Jessica, uh, my, big, my question for you is, the 2D social media experience has, has paved the ground for the metaverse. And as users have been migrating from this 2D platform to social XR, they do so with increased awareness in issues like pr privacy and safety. How will this user experiences with 2D social media shape their expectation in social XR? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I think I, I would even broaden the question around how our experiences just in our physical reality with technology um, are and, and with other people are gonna shape our experiences in 3D as well. And um, I, I'd like to share a story from one of the first research projects that I did back in 2017. There, was, there were a lot of anecdotal stories of women being harassed in social VR, but there was no like formal documentation of what a woman's first time experience might be in social VR. So I decided to um, run a study and um, I recruited 13 women. I brought them into my office and had them do demos of, of different social virtual reality apps. And in the, in the group, in, in, the, in the larger social apps, what I observed was that the behaviors of the women in virtual reality uh, actually um, mirrored the behaviors that women enact in physical reality to avoid street harassment. And so what I observed in physical reality is that women were very, um, very selective about being quiet and not attracting attention to themselves. They walked around the perimeters of groups in order to, uh, again, avoid attracting attention. And then the third thing that they did is they were very careful about selecting their avatar because they just didn't understand, they, they just knew that like showing up as an attractive appearing woman would lead to more attention um, than they might have been, and they, and they weren't entirely sure what to expect in each of these social VR worlds because it was their first time. And so, yes, like I think there's ways that, um, that people's experiences with 2D are going to shape um, how, they how they act in the virtual world and their expectations. Uh, and at the same time, like I think this 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 is a story that really opened my eyes to the extent to which that you know uh, there's some statistic from Cornell University that shows like 80% of women have experienced street harassment by the time they're age 17, and so there's this way that like there's there's certain encoding that happens in our physical reality that is going to translate over there, and then to get to to more specifically address the privacy aspect of your question. Um, I've been like talking to a lot of people about their existing attitudes towards privacy. And there's a lot of ways that people feel extremely distressed about the, the current situation with their mobile phones. And, you know, people don't seem to trust defaults or they'll tell, they'll tell stories of, you know, I, I said, you know, I opted out of, of this privacy setting but then there was an update and then I was auto um, enrolled again. And I and so there's a, a tremendous amount of um, of distrust that is happening in the existing you know, web and mobile space. And I think that is um, that's something that I would predict will continue in the 3D space as well. All right. Thank you so much, Jessica. So now let's open up uh, the floor for discussion with like more general questions. And my first question is like, XR devices and have this potential to dramatically increase the amount of personal data that is collected by a platform. A lot of this data collection is required just for the device to work properly uh, or just to pow or power highly requested features such as avatar face expressions or, or foveated rendering. 
Yet at the same time, users have expressed concerns about data collection and mismanagement by platforms. How do you think a, a social XR platforms can navigate that issue? And I don't know who wants to go first in this case. I can, I can go first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, once. Yeah. So um, I, the way that I would approach this is through principles. So we have two responsible innovation principles that are very relevant to addressing these kinds of issues. The first is controls that matter. And the second is never surprise people. So what this translates to for VR, for example, is an emphasis on transparency and controls. So on the transparency front, I'll give you an example, again, from Horizon Worlds, we have a evidence capture feature um, that is on a rolling buffer stored on device. So every past two minutes of your interactions in a space are, are captured in this way and then constantly overwritten. The goal of this feature is to ensure that you do not have to continue experiencing harm in order to capture the evidence to then send to reviewers who can action on that um, evidence. Um, this, this feature has very clear privacy implications because it is a, a version of always on recording. And so the way that we navigated that principally is by ensuring that we have a large degree of expectation setting and notice and transparency that this feature is in operation in this app. Um, and explaining again, like the why and the fact that we do know that, th that there are trade-offs in between privacy and safety when uh, approaching this type of, of evidence capture. Um, I'll give you an example on the control side. So at the platform level, we have a uh, the ability to turn off whether others can see your current activity in VR. So see whether you're in a certain app, for example. Um, and this can be very important to individuals who um, who want to ensure that their, their presence is not known in a certain app, but also um, for those apps that may have sensitive applications or reveal something about the kind of people that are using them, um, an app that is is focused on the LGBTQ com community, for example. Um, this allows people to be able to um, ensure that they know who knows uh, their interests. So uh, I'll turn it back over to the group if anyone has anything to add. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I can I can jump in on this as well. Yeah, I think there's, um, you know, like Anne, Anne presented some information around like choice and transparency. And I think there's, um, like I just kind of want to build on that as well, and just talk about like there's from the from the people who are building products and the developers, um, there's some choices that they can make about how long is data retained, like how much data is collected, you know, if is the data used only in in the actual session, and then is it you know is it retained ever? Um, does it go on a server? Does it stay on the device? Uh, because there's there's implications around the Fourth Amendment that um, that you know if if things are stored in the cloud, it's possible that they can be uh, they can be accessed. And so um, there's a bipartisan uh, uh, effort in the Senate right now called the Fourth Amendment is not for sale, um, and I believe it has 20 senators on board. And I think like that's one way that um, there, I'm seeing a little bit of like legislation efforts around um, looking at, at data because, you know, this is just around like, I, I think the, the, the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act is, um, is around like existing 2D and 3D experiences and the potential of the, of the 3D devices are that um, they're gonna be collecting a lot more biometric data and it's just gonna be a lot of, it, the potential for biometric like the, the the data streams are going to be become like uh, much more vast. Yeah, I right. would just very oh, quickly. Echo, I, I would just very quickly echo um, just the the need for transparency here, uh, and you know, and I think address this um, just about the way that 
we need to be clear we're messaging to people like, hey, this sort of information is collected and here's how it gets used. Um, there's huge opportunity, um, both sort of in that pre-messaging, but also in regularly reporting back to users and to the public with like, this is the type of data that we did collect and here's how it was handled. Here's how we use it over time. Here are choices we make when we change how we collect data or you know, realize this is more useful than that. All of that I think is is stuff that, um, you know, we in the field and in the practice can be, um, you know, communicating yeah. with apparently to build trust with the public. Right. And then I would just add on add on top of that, um, that there's always going to be power dynamics between the people who are using the technology and the people who are building the technology. And that, you know, the people who are building technology are going to be more knowledgeable and more savvy. And there's ways in which um, that, you know, I think there's some statistic that if you read every single privacy policy that was presented to you for every for every technology, like you would have to spend 50 days of your entire year, eight hours a day reading privacy policies. And so, yeah, I think there is there's certainly a role for transparency and also like what are the defaults that are in place already that are going to help people? Because I see I see there's a much higher market demand for um, for privacy enhancing technologies. And there's um, there's a new startup called the Rise of Privacy Tech that is just, um, they're connecting VCs to startups in, and because I think there's just the startups who are doing um, privacy enhancing technologies because I think they're like kind of looking down the road and being like, all right, what is the potential to disrupt some of the existing models that are out there? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and Jessica, I wanna go from, from a thread you mentioned like about like the role of Congress and the role of legislation in this. And I think with privacy, like we see like the, the amount of data collected by platforms can potentially keep increasing and therefore their responsibility as stewards of, of that data. The US has yet to pop, pass a federal privacy law. Like there's been a lot of drafts, a lot of discussion, but as of today, we have a difficult and costly patchwork of laws, not only at the state level, but I'd say at, the, at a global scale with uh, legislation like the GDPR. In XR2XR, what, what, what do you think are the key questions a federal privacy bill must answer, like the key topics is much addressed and what principles should back a law of that nature? Yeah, um, I can just really um, briefly speak to, um, I put out seven metaverse privacy principles. I published it as an article on Medium to invite feedback. And so there's a lot around um, the privacy principles that I would love to see legislation address around specifically power dynamics, you know, centering on the needs of marginalized groups. And I think there's ways that the U.S. can learn from other countries. Like in Chile, they passed a law um, around protecting mental privacy uh, because I think there's a way that this data can be um, can be used to make inferences like biometric data could potentially be used to make inferences about people. And so I think that there's a lot of models out there. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. Charlotte, man, do you have anything to say on this topic or? Yeah. I'm just waiting to get into the content moderation question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Jessica mentioned her her privacy principles. I think that's worth a read. I would also say that the um, I mentioned already controls that matter, and uh, and also like never surprise people. But the another principle is is uh, put people first, and the way that that looks, as as Jessica just mentioned, is ensuring that there are default privacy settings that are really understandable by the users. Um, and so, for example, when we are, uh, we just recently announced we're building out a new account structure, uh, meta accounts um, that are going into um, effect in August. And for these accounts, there will, there are settings, there are default settings that you can choose uh, more private versus more public. Um, and those have uh, features like the ones I mentioned, things like um, the most private one, you won't be able to uh, see people's activity in VR. Um, and, and that is communicated at the point of account setup. So people can kind of select, Hey, like I'm somebody that wants to be, uh, more like a influencer, more accessible to others, more of a, of a public persona. 
versus, um, you know, I really just want to do my own thing and and not have, I'm, I'm on the latter front. I'm, I'm one of the, the people that is uh, more of a private account on, on, on Oculus. Um, and I just hang out with my friends, for example. And so knowing how people intend to use the product and building in a way that fits their expectations about what privacy settings are out there is, is critical. Thank you so much, Ann. And now, as Charlotte uh, requested, I think it's, it's a good time to jump into the content moderation uh, part of the conversation. And I think what, when addressing content moderation in social XR, it is very important to take into account the difference in the nature of the content in these platforms, especially compared to 2D uh, platforms. Like right now in social media, you post content and, and it's hosted in these platforms for long periods of time and it's always there. Mixar, it's more behaviors, it's conversations, it's gestures, and it's a lot of like ephemeral, real-time content. And, and what challenges and advantages does it introduce for like a, in terms of enforcing trust and safety standards in a platform? So Charlotte, I don't know if you want to go first. Here I go, yeah. Um, well, I mean, Anne actually uh, previewed a little bit of this, just mentioning how uh, the tooling is going to be different uh, and the expectations are going to need to be somewhat different, you know, as, as we look into more of an XR format. Um, I think one of the real opportunities and advantages that XR presents in the content moderation field is actually that you might get a little more context with certain types of reports. Um, you know, in the field, I, I think one of the challenges we've always had with static content is lack of context. Um, you know, the, the classic example we often use is if someone uploads a photo of a trash can and tags someone in it, we get a report on that is that you're saying this person is trash? Is that you're saying, hey, remember to take the trash out? Is that, hey, you were looking for recommendations about the best garbage can and here it is, right? You often don't have that type of contextual or, or sort of behavioral background to be able to make the right choice about, is this harassment or is this product recommendations? Um, with, with XR, you're able to perhaps go a little bit more into that story, right? And especially if you've set it up and communicated accordingly around, we are going to be doing this two minutes of capture. We're going to have a chat log. You, you sort of have that narrative picture a little more strongly. Um, and that can really set us up to do, I think, a, a much more thorough job on enforcement when it comes to things like harassment in particular. Um, you know, there, there is a definitely a downside, um, which is also present in, in more traditional moderation, which is it's still going to be contextual to what's going on in real life, right? Um, you still are going to need uh, real strong capabilities on uh, slang and a bunch of different languages. You know, there, there are a lot of those same challenges that we're going to have regardless of context. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd flag here is um, it's really important to make abuse easy to like to, to, to flag, right? Um, and one of the uh, things that we do worry a little bit about with um, XR is, and I mean, this is true for, again, a lot of types of, of content is if it's not clear how to signal that something wrong is happening, so something's going wrong in your experience, um, then it's gonna be hard for the team to know about it. However, if you make it really easy for people to signal that something is going wrong, you need to be prepared to then staff and investigate those reports accordingly. And I think that is one of the um, frontiers that we don't, I think we're really going to need to keep an eye on when it comes to sort of impact on staffing levels and, and professionals readiness to be able to, to respond to those. Yeah, Jessica, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I could. I would. I would. Um, one, I take. I take your questions, and then I kind of like expand them out. So I'm. I'm. I'm going to do it again. Uh, <laughs> you keep asking about like the 2D, how how like social media and 2D is going to influence us uh, in in 3D. And yes, like I I agree that our that will that will shape us there. And um, I've. Um, I, I really recommend uh, the author Britton Heller. She's been working in as a human rights lawyer in this space as well. And um, one of the models that she uses to describe the challenges around content moderation in the metaverse are that you know you there's the interact the fast interactivity interactivity um, of social media. There's um, there's some elements around gaming where you know you might be doing activities and you're going back and forth. And then the third is that um, the metaverse can also likely learn from dating apps where people might be, you know, meeting online, but then having like experiences in physical reality 
you know, like, I mean, Pokemon Go is one of the most popular augmented reality apps ever, ever created. And so I would just want to bring that up as a model as well, because, yeah, I think there are lessons to be learned from from 2D. And I, you know, again, like this is a it's because it becomes more and more complex with these layers that are added in. Yeah, and, and I'll add on a few things. So you asked what challenges and advantages this introduces in terms of trust and safety, given that there are these differences between these XR environments and uh, 2D. Um, and one of the examples I'll give is bespoke tooling for VR needs to focus on giving people controls in the moment, given they're in these interactive situations. Um, and so one of the controls that we built out is uh, personal boundary, which is this four foot distance between you and the next avatar. Uh, and you have control over whether that is on for everyone, on uh, just for non-friends. And uh, the default is on for, on for non-friends because we expect that uh, you would want to get closer to people who you already know. And four feet is a lot of feet when it comes down to it. Um, but, but also I, I think it's important to note that uh, in, our term, in terms of bespoke tooling, a lot of it is um, in a sense reactive. So like there's safe zone within uh, Horizon Worlds, which gives you quick access to the ability to report and block and mute someone. But more importantly, allows you to take a real a break from the real time. Like you, you are transported in a way to this little space of your own um, within that larger world, but avatars are grayed out and uh, you can't hear them. And that makes all the difference when you are reacting strongly and emotionally to something that has just occurred. Um, and, and so to me, those are pretty great examples of the kind of bespoke tooling that aids in this new form of content moderation, where the focus is on, okay, what can we do uh, in these real time conduct uh, situations? Thanks, Anne. Now I want to make a, a jump into what, what I think is it's a key or it's one of the biggest uh, concerns regarding safety in the metaverse. And it's children and teenage use, and, and particularly with the problem of age verification. In general, this has been an issue that has been unresolved since the start of the internet era. I think we've always been there's always been concerns of children and, and, and teenagers and the internet accessing content that is made for mature and in general age controls had not been very effective. They usually tend to find workarounds. And biometric logging or face recognition has been touted as a possible solution in XR, but tends to like create a lot of backlash in terms of, of privacy concerns. So in your opinion, how can platform tackle the issue of minors accessing uh, mature content in XR? And uh, uh, I don't know who wants to go first. Uh. Let's say, I think we could all have an opinion on this. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, you you are right to observe that this is a unresolved challenge, uh, I think, in the field. Um, what I would say is just, that, and this is my perspective as a, as a practitioner, is that um, ID verification remains one of the most solid solutions that we have um, it, because it, it does skirt some of the concerns that we have around use of biometric data. Um, but it uh, necessarily precludes full participation from certain folks. And I think it's not sort of a, a silver bullet solution in that way. Um, you know, folks who don't have access to IDs, folks whose IDs don't reflect their, their identity, um, you know, are all going to sort of lose out if that's the sort of uh, if that's the standard we cleave to as an industry. And that's why things like biometric become sort of more more interesting, I think, or sort of more, there, there's an access point there. Um, I think that fundamentally um, there, well, and again, this is like my, my perspective um, as, a, as a professional is, I think we've often really seen there's almost always a necessary trade-off between privacy and certainty around things like age and identity. Um, and what's going to be important for us as a society is to navigate, okay, well, what what is most important to us when it comes to that spectrum? And, and how do we then be prepared to navigate those trade-offs? Um, you know, an example I'd use is that 
young people are often very good at identifying themselves if you're able to look at a lot of different pieces of information, right? The, the language they're using, the, uh, the objects or the places they associate themselves with, the people they spend time with, the, the times of day they're active, the locations they're accessing the service from, like all of those could be used as actually pretty good indicators of age. And that is a huge can of private information that I don't think any of us necessarily feel good about prying the top off of and saying, well, look, it's probably a young person, right? But that's often sort of the, the, the set of trade-offs we're looking at is like, how certain can you be for the safety of a young person versus how much are we willing to, you know, sort of look into that person's identity? Um, so, you know, this is like not an answer, but I think it, it is very much a discussion about the trade-offs that are present. And I don't think there's a lot of, I, I haven't observed a lot of consensus uh, globally on, on that question. Yeah, this is a complex and evolving problem. Like we invent new ways to um, prevent teen access and teens will figure out a way to get around it, I think is the right thing you put your finger on. Like the, and therefore, because it's a complex and evolving problem, we need a multifaceted and iterative response. Um, so it includes several things. I mean, one of the one of the things is parental controls, which we have at the VR platform level now. So we believe that parental supervision is another important um, signal in, in this approach. Devices are set up uh, to provide um, the user with the control uh, over like what, excuse me, the parent with the control over what experiences their, their teen can access. And they're designed in a way to prompt conversations between the teen and the parent about what experiences uh, they are having. Um, another way that is important um, in overall is just the tools that I mentioned, the, the baseline tools that are accessible to anyone of every age um, on our platform will be able to enhance uh, the protection for, for teens in these spaces. Um, the other piece is education. And I think this is a very important piece. So one of the coolest things about VR is that education can be experiential. You can go through the motions of turning on safe zone. Um, and in fact, like in our beginning intro to Horizon Worlds, that experience, uh, we do just that. But it's also important to remind people of this tooling because it doesn't, a lot of it does not have a real world analog. I can't just turn off um, an interaction that I'm having in real time in, in physical space. Um, and so I think that building that muscle memory is not only a challenge, but one that is solved pretty creatively within experiential envi environments. The other thing I think is important um, to connect to Charlotte's point is the ability to for other users to give us signal about a user's age. So reporting someone as underage, which we have um, at the VR platform level. Um, and if that report uh, gets to us, we take uh, measures to remove the account if it's found to be underage. Um, that process does include things like ID verification, um, as mentioned, but I, I love um, Charlotte's response because it very perfectly clarifies the trade-off um, with, with uh, requiring that degree of age verification. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, we can move on to the next question. No, no, no. Go ahead. You want to, if you want to say anything else? Well, I think there was just a there's just a way in which the pandemic really highlighted um, that parents use technology as a babysitter, um, and this is not a judgmental thing that I'm trying to say. Like I think how did you get into my house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no judgment, no judgment towards anyone. Like whatever it takes to get through to get through the global pandemic. Um, but I think it's just worth mentioning in this context that. Um, that, you know, parents have their own goals when it comes to technology. And, um, and it, and so I think that it's, um, you know, I think there would be in an ideal world when I think about how, how children would be interacting in VR, there would be, um, you know, there could be, there could be family oriented apps. Like there's, there's apps that have been developed that are designed for one person to be in the headset and then other people to be in physical reality around them, like interacting and like playing games together. 
Um, and then just like the, the education potential for children in VR to learn things in 3D is tremendous. So I think I just want to name like there's so much value in this technology. And, you know, my vision for how I would want the technology to be used may not necessarily be aligned with like what a busy working parent might um, may or may not be paying attention to um, as well. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. And now that we're approaching the Q&A section of, of the panel, uh, I want to go with one of the first questions uh, from the audience. And, and in, as it relates to this particularly, is the problem with social, like social media and I think with XR too, especially as, as we get to photorealistic avatars, if we were to get there, it's online authentication. Uh, it's the, the concern is that what if I can pretend to be someone else uh, in the internet and, and how can deceive and, and, and that can foster fraud practices. How do you think uh, you can address this problem in the metaverse? I don't know if we want to go with Charlotte first. Yeah, I can start. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, the, and yeah, no problem. The um, the value. There, so as with anything, we've discussed trade offs nearly every time. The value to experiencing a different identity can be very high. So like, I like to be a robot in virtual spaces. And a lot of the reason that I like to be a robot is because people can't make certain assumptions uh, about you as they could in the real world. I mean, Jessica cited her research on uh, women's behavior in virtual spaces. Um, and, and I think that that is exactly right. Uh, we carry a lot over from our expectations about how we interact and others interact um, in physical spaces to the virtual. Um, but one of the one thing that's very important to, to mention in the context of things like impersonation is uh, the way that it manifests in digital immersive spaces is different than how we would traditionally see it manifest in uh, social media. So impersonation, say on Facebook, looks like a profile that is clearly not the individual that is behind that profile. Um, the wide range of uh, identity and the way that we play out and experience identity in virtual spaces makes it a lot harder to identify um, a, a clear malicious representation. So um, while our policies, uh, our policy set, the conduct in VR policy within VR does uh, address impersonation, um, it also is clear to call out that uh, if you are doing things like role playing, um, that as long as you are transparent about that, that is, is okay. I and mean, one of my favorite um, communities that I watch, uh, if I watch Spawn, is, is actually on Twitch. It's uh, Grand Theft Auto Online, uh, no pixel community, if you guys uh, want to go check this out. Um, but it is just a whole bunch of people role playing in real time. And while they aren't immersed in their avatars, those avatars are experiencing a 3D world. Um, and a lot of them are um, actively being people they are not on purpose. And and it's it's both... Um, awesome because you can see how the exploration of identity takes many forms, uh, but but also you can you can also see how one can hurt someone else um, by by pretending to be someone they're not. Uh, yeah, hard issue to navigate. Uh, part of it is through policies, and other part of it is through a lot of the tooling that I mentioned previously. Yeah, this one's throwing me back to my Ultima online personas from back in the day. I mean, I, I think that's right that so much of what um, so much of what makes things like uh, the metaverse fun is because you don't have to be who you are in real life, right? I think that is a huge draw for people, and I think this is where it comes back to um, just sort of like content moderation, preparedness, and principles, like impersonation is an issue we have on all sorts of platforms and all sorts of manifestations today, and the main question we're asking is, is, is someone getting hurt, right? Is someone through the act of impersonation hurting other people, defrauding them, whatever that is. And that's where we look, I think, a lot more at like account level trends, um, you know, being able to understand, okay, this person is saying this to that person and also to 200 other people. And now there's like a bank account getting exchanged. Those sorts of signals are things I would expect we're going to continue to use in, in any online um, sort of interaction, like, circumstance, regardless of whether that's metaverse or not. Um, and I think that will remain effective, uh, you know, for metaverse presentations. I think that the challenge is and, and always has been sort of that one to one relationship building. And I think um, that is where 
a lot of vulnerable people are the most vulnerable is feeling that they have built this authentic relationship with someone who authentically cares about them. And that is going to be, um, that's going to look somewhat different in the metaverse. But I think in a, in a lot of the fundamentals, it's going to be similar to a lot of the other ways we see that problem today. Um, and there's not a 100% uh, there's, there's not a 100% catch rate on those. Um, and I, I wish that there were, and I hope someday there will be, but um, I think we also need to be prepared to, to have that happen um, and, and, you know, understand that that is one of the sort of, t one of the experiences that, you know, you get enough people together in any place, in any circumstance, you know, that, that is going to be one of the outcomes. Sorry, I'm, just, I'm real downer here. I'm like, listen up, folks. Sometimes it's going to go wrong. I'm like, yeah, that's my job. Yeah, I want to touch on a topic that I think has been transversal uh, in, in our discussion. It's, I think, like, the, when, when you analyze how, how safety and internet experience was has been crafted throughout the years, it tended to have a bigger role in, in like in you as an individual, you craft your internet experience. But the last years, there's been a, a cult cultural shift that you can call it towards calling for a bigger role for platforms, uh, and and like platforms must provide m me the safe environment instead of me crafting it. And how do you think uh, that does does that play with that trade off that we we talked about, like the safety privacy trade off that goes on? That if we were to allow these platforms to take that more uh, active role in, in creating the safe spaces that it might might trample a lot of, of privacy concerns and, and privacy rights. So I don't know if you want to start um, with Jessica. Well, the first, the first thing that I would say is I don't necessarily see like um, safety and privacy as like two ends of a polarity as like a binary thing that we must that we must choose between like i think there's there's really interesting ways that um companies are are navigating that like i think ways ways to get out of any sort of binary framing is something that i would that i would advocate for um in the first place and then the other thing that i would bring up is that um i think there's just like that that this this like um you know, when I talked about the the people would be spending 50 days of their entire year reading all of the privacy policies or that are that are presented to them, um, and so people don't do that. Like they just click agree, 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 agree. And I think what's what's coming out and like a Cornell professor named Vanessa Bonds has done a lot of work around cons consent and just people's natural tendency to be agreeable and the ways in which. Um, the existing like ways of presenting terms and conditions are are not consensual to people. Like they don't fully grasp the implications and the potential consequences of this. So you know the extreme example is um, there was a priest who used Grinder, and um, somebody really wanted to out that priest, and so they bought location data, they triangulated it, and um, and you know, did the priest agree to the terms and conditions of Grinder? Like, yes. Um, was he outed consensually? Like, no. So there's um, there's a way in which there's um, there's consequences to the data that's being collected, and I think that is um, what I'm really like. What I'm really hoping to like um, help bring about are like what are what is like this new path? What was this third way? in which like both privacy and safety um, can be considered. And, you know, really like, how do you build consensual uh, technology that people really trust and are excited to use? Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Travel, I don't know if you, especially as you touch a little bit on this topic, if you'd like to add a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I I love that, and I I love the way that you're talking about like obviously, safety and privacy aren't I, I don't think they are a polarity, right? And to that, I would also add, you know, for a lot of these platforms, it, it's just good business to not have it be real wild on there, you know. And I'm not I'm not here to say like no one's allowed to have a wild experience, but like fundamentally, um, 
I, I, there aren't a lot of platforms that are designed to be like, let's be offensive as soon as you log in. Yeah, like it's just like not a good user retention strategy. Um, you know, I think it is reasonable to expect a safe experience online. Like that's just like, I think that's very clear. Um, I think on top of that, we need to have um, like a mutual understanding of what safety means. And that's where I think it starts to get trickier. You know, I think um, a lot of the, a lot of you know, what we as professionals try to provide is meaningful safety, whatever you know platform we're we're working on or or any platform you know maybe we're not working on any platform right it, it it's the kind of thing where we can we can take our collective experiences and put together an experience that makes sense to us as a safe experience, but that's necessarily not going to be comprehensive of everyone's opinions about what mean, what safety means. Um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about Jessica saying about parents letting their kids online and not just because I am a parent, um, but like you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors going into that, right? Like parents are busy and of course they want to be involved in their kids' lives. And also their kids are like hearing about stuff at school and they're like, I'm going to try it. And like, there's just all these moving pieces that any one, you know, any one moment in that sequence, someone logs in and sees something they didn't want to see, that's a hard set of variables to control for in aggregate. And so I think that's why it's important to, to continually work towards a shared definition of this is like, this is what we mean by safety. It does not encompass these things. It does encompass these things. And that's where it comes back to principles. That's where it comes back to values. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a, a space where a lot of fruitful dialogue is occurring now and, and will continue to occur. Yeah, and, and, and I wanna touch on the, that last point you, you talk about and this like, children and teens without a doubt, like we're gonna play a role in the, in the metaverse. Like you, you see like the platforms that have laid the foundation, like Roblox, Fortcraft, uh, Fortnite, Minecraft and, and and platforms might not be able to like, afford to ignore this demographic. Uh, it's, we want to be viable if they want to have not only financially, but like just in being entertaining platforms full of, full of users. At one point, they might have to incorporate the, this demographic. Yet, in, in the, what we see in social media, there's been efforts to create children-focused platforms, just to throw an example, Instagram Kids. But that also has led to a lot of pushback. And, and how do you think a platform might be able to create this mechanism for like child-centered design or if I they might have like face a lot, face a lot of pushback because of the public skepticism to, towards platforms right now I got big opinions on this can I start <laughs> yeah go ahead so the thing is is that young people are using these platforms like kids are using online services and the choice in my opinion this is just my opinion it cannot be like no kids on the internet or, um, you know, like put it this way. I think we have to have um, intentional safe places for children online because otherwise the incentive is for them to lie about the fact that they're kids. And that's what we see over and over again as practitioners. And it's really hard to keep people safe if they are trying to continually like get around the, the things you've, you've constructed for them in thoughtful ways. Um, I thought it was you used an interesting turn of phrase introducing this question, which is, um, of course, now I'm not going to get it back to you verbatim, but it was sort of this impression of uh, we're not going to be able to, like, like platforms aren't going to be able to, like, ignore these users or, like, put it off or whatever. And I think, actually, the, the opportunity is to actively incorporate young people into the design of these products and services, even if that means they're under 13, frankly, especially if that means they're under 13. Um, Amanda Lenhart at Data and Society did a really interesting paper last year called The Unseen Teen, which talks about the ways that um, platforms think a lot about under 13s because it's like illegal to have some of that stuff. So we got to have a plan. And then they think a lot about over 18s. But there's this middle of 13 to 17 where, you know, unless you're like a child, you know, a youth focused platform, you're sort of not considered as a full demographic. And it's a really interesting report and I really encourage folks to, to read it because it talks a lot about the opportunity that actually is presented by intentionally bringing the needs of young people into our communities and privacy is a big part of that, right? And hearing from the, the young people themselves about their perceptions of that experience because they're gonna be doing it, right? They are, they are online. And so I think the, the onus is on us, you know, as sort of technology professionals to figure out how do we acknowledge that as a reality? How, how do we help society acknowledge that as a reality? And then make sure that we're really building that ideal experience. 
Yeah, and I, I don't know if you have anything to add from the, the experience with Horizon and, and and how it's been trying to tackle the the presence of kids and, and teenagers mainly in the platform. Yeah, so I already mentioned our um, underage reporting flow, uh, which which is accessible from Horizon as well. The, uh, the other things I want to talk about in relation to this question are uh, we hear a lot about teen safety, um, but I also think that teen autonomy is incredibly important. Um, and teenagers aren't just one block of people, right? There's different degrees of maturity, um, which is why, for example, our, our parental supervision tools really aim at driving the conversation between adults and kids about what's appropriate for them, given the context of, of their life and where they are at in it. Um, the other thing that I think uh, is quite relevant to this is building in age gating. So in our Oculus TV product, um, R-rated movies are, are age gated. Um, and there are similar real world analogies to how this works, but it, it can be very seamless in virtual spaces because you won't even see that that is an option. Uh, for example, whereas if you walk by a movie theater, you might see, hey, like that movie's playing. Oh, I've heard that's really cool. Like I want to go see that R-rated movie um, if, if you're a, a teenager. Um, so I think those kind of tools also play a role. Uh, and lastly, we've talked a little bit about education, but I want to double down on it. We've been working with uh, Dr. Lewis Bernstein, who's the former executive vice president of education research and outreach at Sesame Workshop, um, to work on developing appropriate digital literacy content for um, teens in, in the metaverse. And, and I think that that's critical because if anyone's going to operate in this space and understanding how to do so in a way that is salient is, is important. Yeah, and I would just plus one to that work that the Sesame Workshop is doing because, um, yeah, I think they've, they also have a partnership happening with XRA right now as well. And I think that, you know, they just bring this vast, ex vast experience around children and education that um, I'm, I'm personally I'm very excited to learn from. And then another place that I would recommend, um, you know, if, if platforms were, were curious, um, like there's, there's been a lot of experimentation around Minecraft and there's a UC Irvine professor named Mimi Ido who developed like a teen mentoring program uh, around Minecraft. So it was like the, it was like the older, the, old, the teens, like those, those unseen teens, she gave them a specific role of, of like training the younger kids on on Minecraft and like this is not only like this is the technical way that you build in Minecraft but this is the culture that we want to have and these are the things that we care about and these are our values and so it was and again like that was that was a small scale experiment that Professor Ito ran and I think it showed um, it showed like this huge potential to actually give teens a specific role and assign them, a, you know, like pe people tend to feel really motivated when they have a specific role and specific goals. And so I, I, I'm really interested in creative solutions around that, where you can build up like a really, um, a really healthy culture of, um, of fun and safety. And, you know, it's not something that necessarily the platform um, needs to be like, you know, doing doing from the top down perspective, but are there more bottom up approaches in this into this question? Right, and I think as we are just two minutes about to, to hit time, I think we, let's wrap up the conversation for today. First, Anne, Charlotte and Jessica, I wanna thank you in, for joining us today and, and do like this virtual clap, I guess, as doing this webinar. <laughs> And then for everyone in the audience, uh, for those wishing to revisit this conversation, you can find the full recording on ITIF's YouTube channel. And to keep up with ITIF's latest insights into AR, VR, and other tech policy discussions, make sure you follow us on social media and sign up for a newsletter, which you can, which you can find on our website. I want to wish everyone a rest of the day. Thank you.